Okay, well, welcome everyone. I think we can get started now. Uh, for those of you who haven't come to a webinar before, I'm Jennifer Boyko. I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific Operations uh, with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the webinar, which is entitled Potentially Modifiable Risk Factors for Low Cognition and Dementia. Could Canada Reduce Dementia by 50%? Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Centre and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the, within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. I also want to acknowledge that Western University, where our presenters are at today, is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee and the Lene, Lenapewak and the Chonanton uh, nations on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One, One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Uh, as attendees of this webinar, I do encourage you to continue uh, learning following the webinar today and to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land where we currently have the privilege to do research, live and work, wherever that may be. So let's review a couple of housekeeping points now. Uh, everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar today. If you do need to change or test your audio during the webinar, you can click on audio settings, which is on the bottom of the Zoom window. At the end of today's session, there will be a question and answer session. If you have a question for the presenter during the webinar, you can post it in the Q&A box, which is located in the bottom toolbar. The questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar. Questions will also be visible to all attendees. Uh, if you have any technical trouble concerning the webinar, we ask you to use the chat box, which is on the side of your screen, to communicate with our webinar team. So if you can post your answer, your questions in the Q&A, but any technical issues in the chat, that would be very helpful. Finally, a sur feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, and we invite you to complete it after exiting the Zoom session today. Um, this brief survey will provide us with important feedback that we can use to plan future some future webinars like the one today. So moving on to the webinar, today's webinar, like I said, is uh, entitled Potentially Modifiable Risk Factors for Low Cognition and Dementia to Canada Reduce Dementia by 50%. The webinar will be presented by PhD candidate Sarim Sun and Dr. Mark Speechley of Western University. Um, unfortunately, one of the presenters, Dr. Manuel uh, Montero Odasso, is unable to join us today, but I, I am I'm assured we are in good hands. Um, Sarim Sun is a PhD candidate in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Western University. Her PhD is looking to identify a specific combination of risk factors that are most likely to produce the greatest benefit on preserving cognition when targeted at population at the population level. Her research interests include healthy aging, lifestyle risk factors, dementia risk reduction, and prevention. Dr. Mark, Mark Speechley is a professor emeritus in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostat at Western as well. As a methodology, he has designed numerous observational and experimental clinical trials in aging and also neurogenerative conditions, including dementia. He played a critical role in designing, in designing the ca Canadian study to postpone the onset of dementia through multi-domain lifestyle modifications, including Synergic 1 and 2 trials. So I will now pass it on to both of them. I'm not sure who's first up, but uh, we will get started. Okay, I think I'm first up. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for inviting us. Uh, great to see this turnout and we appreciate your attendance. Dr. Montero Adasso sends his regrets. Uh, Surim is our PhD student. We're delighted with her work so far. She comes to us from Brock with her MSc in Health Studies. Uh, this is a really important topic. You're probably all aware of lots of stories in the popular press about can we reduce dementia by 40% or 50%. There are different numbers, of course, as, as is uh, to be expected. 
And the CLSA is an extremely valuable resource for answering this question because it has a large sample size with people as young as 45. And there's lots of, ev there's increasing evidence every day that we should be starting prevention of dementia earlier uh, than 65 or 75, certainly earlier than 85. So that's why the CLSA is such a valuable resource and why we're so happy that Surum uh, came to work with us on this, uh, on this project. So that's my introduction and uh, I'll turn it over to Surum now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Speechley. And also thanks Jennifer for a great introduction and also Jacqueline for handling everything behind the scene today. I am very happy to share my PhD study here today and I will start my presentation with rising prevalence and instance of dementia in Canada. So in Canada, over half a million people were living with dementia in 2020, and this number is expected to triple in next 30 years. This is increased from 1 in 60 Canadians in 2020 to 1 in 28 Canadians in 2050. When we are looking at increase in incidence, so new dementia cases, it's going to be increased from 15 cases every hour to 21 cases every hour. And as you may know, this increase in dementia prevalence and incidence is mostly due to the growing aging population in our country. Regarding etiology of dementia, dementia is a multifactorial condition involving both non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors, including those related to health behaviors and illnesses across the lifespan. While age and APOE genotype are the largest risk factor for dementia, the 2020 report of the Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention, and Care announced that over 40% of dementia cases worldwide can be prevented if we modify 12 risk factors throughout the lifespan. These 12 risk factors were less education in early life, hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, hypertension, heavy alcohol use, and obesity in midlife, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, and air pollution and diabetes in later life. These 12 risk factors altogether are called the life course model of dementia prevention, and their estimate of 49% suggests a large potential to prevent or delay dementia worldwide. So can changes in these risk factors really prevent or reduce dementia risk? We can see from a century of progress in cardiovascular disease prevention, which demonstrated that lifestyle changes explained nearly half of significant reductions in heart disease and stroke mortality. While the remaining 20 to 50% of this reduction was explained by medical and surgical treatment. So now coming back to dementia, I said dementia prevalence and incidence are increasing due to the growing number of aging population as shown in this figure here. However, when we look at age specific prevalence and incidence, we recently begin to see a decline in high income countries. This attenuated prevalence and incidence could be explained by improvements in lifestyles and nutrition, which are likely reflecting impact of cardiovascular prevention strategies and smoking cessation campaign that has been implemented over the past two decades. And additionally, this could be also due to increased education level resulting from compulsory education and healthcare system or healthcare technology. The prevalent the preventable burden of dementia associated with risk factors has been also estimated in other countries. However, this has not been done in Canada. The preventable burden of dementia due to risk factors are estimated based on population attributable fraction, which is also called PATH. PATH is an epidemiological measure widely used to assess the public health impact of risk factors in population as it incorporates both prevalence and association of risk factor with the outcome. So this specifically indicates that the proportion of dementia in the population that, would, that could be prevented if we remove the risk factor, for instance, physical inactivity completely from our population. So greater path indicates the greater contribution to outcomes of dementia in our study or in this area. 
with a growing body of literature found that sleep disturbance increased the risk of dementia, sleep disturbance has been identified as dementia risk factor. However, concerning recency of the studies, sleep disturbance has not been included in the life course model of dementia and its population impact has not been estimated. And now I will hand it over to Dr. Speechley. Thank you, Sarah. So there have been a lot of intervention trials uh, over the past decade, and many of you are probably familiar with the FINGER trial. That FINGER stands for um, the Finland uh, Geriatric Intervention Trial. And there are several others that have been uh, proposed and funded around the world. And most of these are uh, multifactorial, multi-domain intervention trials but they target; they tend to target different uh, risk factors. So it's very difficult to put together what's happening. The signal so far, though, is that we have we can demonstrate modest uh, uh, reductions in incident dementia if we target uh, risk factors. Next slide, please. So when we do intervention studies, and I don't want to go long into this topic, but we're methodologists as epidemiologists, and so we find this very interesting. We have two basic choices. We can do the standardly tailored design, which most trials up till, up till now have used. And basically that involves randomizing people with more than one risk factor to two groups, and then hoping that if we intervene in the, in the one group, the intervention group, we can reduce the number of risk factors and reduce the incidence of cognitive impairment, which is a great design, but it doesn't allow us to know anything about combinations, specific combinations of uh, risk factors. Inevitably, when we do this kind of study, people say, well, which combinations work most, uh, work best? And the only way to do that really well is a factorial design. And so uh, we would randomize in the case of two risk factors, we would risk uh, randomize to the control group, uh, intervention A only, intervention B only, or both. And this is a very powerful design that allows us to uh, show interaction effects. And the cool thing about interactions is that if there is strong interaction and we reduce the effect of A, we're going to, have, we're going to reduce its main effect, but we're also going to reduce its interaction effect through uh, risk factor B. So it's really important, I think, that we be thinking ahead of the next generation of trials. And I'm a strong advocate of small uh, strategically designed factorial trials. Next slide, please. So there, there are gaps in the literature. The distributions of risk factors differ across populations. It's kind of difficult to knit a sweater, uh, a meta-analysis from the, from the findings because of heterogeneity. Uh, little is known about the uh, dementia risk factor profile in the population of Canada. So the, uh, and as Sura mentioned earlier, the uh, sleep disturbance is a relatively recent risk factor. So little is known about that. And the most effective combination of risk factors on the basis of, as Suram said, on the basis of prevalence and the potential for prevention, the strength of association, we're still looking at that. So that's why this, this uh, research is so uh, interesting. And I think we're back to you now, Suram. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Speechley. Um, so my PhD study aimed to estimate the preventable burden of dementia related to modifiable risk factors in Canada and to explore which combination of modifiable risk factor have the highest prevalence and the strongest association with cognitive change in Canadian adults. So the first study had three objectives. First objective was to estimate the prevalence and potential population impact of 12 modifiable risk factors, including sleep disturbance. Second objective was to assess how the prevalence and potential population impact differ across sex and age groups. The last objective of this study was to compare our estimate with the global estimate from the Lancet report and other countries. So I use baseline data from Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and I believe most of you know about CLSA, but to give a quick overview, CLSA is a large national longitudinal study following over 50,000 middle-aged and older Canadian adults for at least 20 years, and follow-ups are being conducted every three years for all of them. 
CLSA has two participant cohorts, tracking cohort and comprehensive cohort. I use the comprehensive and sorry, the participant, two types of participant cohorts, they differ in their sampling strategies and the types of data being collected. So I use data from comprehensive cohort as it has physical examination data and which includes hearing tests. For the 12 modifiable risk factors, we identified those that were included in the Lancet report using the same definition they used and included sleep disturbance as well. Less education was defined as less than secondary school graduation, so which indicating less than high school graduation. For hearing, um, CLSA measured unaided pure tone hearing tests. And we defined hearing loss in our study based on a threshold of greater than 25 decibels at 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz in the better ear. Traumatic brain injury was defined as obtaining a head injury that resulted in losing consciousness. For hypertension, we used self-reported diagnosis of hypertension or systolic blood pressure greater than 140 millimercury. Our call intake in CLSA was reported in number of standard drink consumed per week, and we converted this to unit of alcohol per week using UK National Health Service formula. And more than 21 units of alcohol per week was defined to defined as excessive alcohol use. BMI greater than 30 was used for obesity, and current smoking status in the past 30 days was used to define smoking. For depression, we use self-reported diagnosis of clinical depression, and social, I, oops, social isolation was measured as less than one social contact within a month with family, friends, or neighbors. Physical activity level was measured with PACE, physical activity scale for the elderly in the CLSA, and minutes of physical activity per level per week was calculated based on the frequency and duration reported in PACE. Based on the calculated minutes per week by activity type, we defined physical inactivity as less than 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity or less than 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity. Diabetes was defined using self-reported diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, and for very last risk factor, sleep disturbance was defined based on their self-reported poor sleep quality, insomnia, sleep apnea, daytime sleepness, and restless leg syndrome. For data analysis, we estimated prevalence and population attributable fraction of individual risk factors. While greater prevalence indicates how common the risk factor is in the population, greater PATH indicates larger contribution to dementia, so it indicates greater prevention potential. We use the same analytic technique used in the Lancet report to calculate the PATH. This includes weighting the PATH to adjust for risk factor overlapping using principal component analysis. To build the life course model, the prevalence of risk factor was estimated by the lifespan. Early life included all ages, so from 45 to 85, and mid life was defined as 55 to 64 years, and later life was defined as 65 to 85. We also stratified our analysis by sex and four age groups to explore how the risk factor profile differ by these characteristics. And lastly, we qualitatively compared our results to the global estimate from the Lancet report and eight other countries that employ the same method. The mean age of study participant was 60 years and 52% of the participants were women. Um, nearly all participants were white and most were married. While one third of the participants had middle incomes, slightly more than one third were coming from high income status and half of the participants were living in central Canada, including which is Ontario and Quebec. Um, here is the prevalence of 12 risk factors and the risk factor with the highest prevalence was physical inactivity, 83%, which was surprisingly very high. Obesity, 31% and hypertension, sorry, obesity, 31%. 
and hypertension 30% and hearing loss 21%. Now, when we look at the potential population impact, which is shown in the last column of the table, as well as in the snake figure on your right, the risk factor that contributed most to dementia was physical inactivity in later life, 10%, followed by hearing loss, 6.5%, obesity, 6.4%, and hypertension in 6.2%. And although sleep disturbance had high prevalence, which was 40%, its population impact was quite modest, and this was due to their small relative risk, so their small association with dementia. And 12 risk factors altogether, they contributed to 49% of dementia cases in Canada. Now, when we look at risk factors that had the least contribution to dementia, that were social isolation, 0.4%, excessive alcohol use, 0.9%, and smoking, 1.5%. This graph here shows the prevalence of each risk factor by age group. So yellow is age group 45 to 54, the youngest group. Pink is 55 to 64. Green is 65 to 74. And the purple color is 75 to 85, which is the oldest group. And we observed increase in prevalence with age for less education, hearing loss, hypertension, social isolation, physical inactivity, and diabetes. For traumatic brain injury, excessive alcohol use, and smoking, we observed decrease in prevalence with age. So they were more prevalent in younger age group than in the later age group. And we also observed sex difference in risk factor prevalence. Gray bar is indicating prevalence in women and blue bar is indicating prevalence in men. And hearing loss, hypertension, excessive alcohol use, and diabetes was more prevalent in men, but depression and physical inactivity were more prevalent in women. And this step graph here shows the potential population impact of 12 risk factors by age groups, and each color indicates each risk factor. And the greater color boxes are indicates greater the population impact. So we observed a trend of increasing prevention potential with age, which rise from 49% at age 45 to 69% at age 75. But most importantly, the prevention potential was already as high as 49% at age 45. Comparing the size of colored cell, the risk factor profiles were similar between age 45 and 64 and 55 and 64. Sorry, 55 and 54 and 55 and 64. And the risk factor profiles were also similar between age 65 to 74 and 75 and 285. But risk factor profile comparing the bars in green box and then red box, the risk factor profile mainly differed by midlife and later life. And compared to the midlife, population impact of less education, hypertension, and diabetes was relatively larger in later life, while the population impact of smoking was larger in midlife. When looking at potential population impact by sex, the prevention potential was similar between men, which was 52%, and also in women, which was also 52%. However, the population impact of depression was larger in women, while the population impact of traumatic brain injury and excessive alcohol use, which is the blue color bar, was larger in men compared to women. For multi-country comparison, we presented POF of nine risk factors that were available in all studies. Comparing our findings to the global estimate and other high-income countries, the prevention potential was greater in Canada and New Zealand. Varying size of each color box by country indicates that risk factor profiles slightly differed by countries. And the, specifically, the risk factor profile of Canada differed from our neighbor country, US, but it was similar to our distant neighbor, Australia and Denmark. Across high-income countries, the prominent risk factor to prevent was hearing loss, physical inactivity, and obesity. 
It is generally expected that the prevention potential would be much greater in low or middle income countries. However, the prevention potential in Canada was fairly similar to other low or middle income countries. And compared to Canada, less education and smoking were more prominent risk factor in these low and middle income countries. And this study was published in the in June in J Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease, and it's open access, and you can use this QR to access the paper. And now moving on to my second paper, which aims to identify the risk factor combination that are both highly prevalent and responsible for greatest cognitive change. I also use the CLSA comprehensive cohort. Um, as it have both physical examination data and full neuropsychological test battery data. And for this analysis, we used baseline and first follow-up data, which was collected after three years of baseline. The same 12 risk factors were identified using the same definition. And as we were interested in the five Sorry, as we were interested in the prevalent combination of risk factors, we identified the five most prevalent diet, triad, and tetrad combinations of risk factors by estimating prevalence of all possible combinations. And that were 66 combinations for diet combination, 220 for triad combinations, and 495 for tetrad combinations. The outcome was cognitive performance measured in composite neuropsychological test Barry Z score. And we were interested in global score, memory, and excretive function. Higher composite Z score indicates generally indicates better performance in cognitive tests. And to assess association between risk factor combinations and change in cognition, I employed linear mixed model using two modeling strategies. So to assess the pooled effect of risk factor combinations or overall effect of the combination, risk factor combinations were fitted as binary indicator of the combination. So having risk factor combinations or not having them and interaction between this combination and time was also fitted in the model as well. To assess whether the joint effect of risk factor combination is greater than the sum of individual effects, which infers biological interaction. Each risk factors were fitted as individual main effect in the model and interaction between all these risk factors and time was also included. All the analysis were limited to the top five most prevalent combinations and the obtained effect measure was mean difference in change in cognition between the groups. And to adjust for confounding, we accounted for age, sex, and other risk factors that were not included in the combination. Overall, 95% of CLSA participants had at least one risk factors, and over 80% of participants had two or more risk factors. The prevalence of having two to four risk factor was higher than other number of combinations. These are the five most prevalent combinations we identified. And the combination that had the highest prevalence was physical inactivity and sleep disturbance for diet, 35%, hypertension, physical inactivity, and sleep disturbance for triad, 15%, and hypertension, obesity, physical inactivity, and sleep disturbance for tetrad, 8%. And the diet with the strongest effect was the combination of hearing loss and physical inactivity. In this global score figure shown here, pink line shows the cognitive change in people with both hearing loss and physical inactivity. And green line, it indicates the cognitive change in people without this combination. Overall, we observed an improvement in cognition, but the improvement was much greater in people without the combination of hearing loss and physical inactivity. In other words, as you can tell from the slope of pink line, the improvement was modest in people with both hearing loss and physical inactivity. Similar pattern, but with greater effect was observed for memory function. Um, while we noted similar pattern for executive function, the effect was weaker than the global function and memory. 
For the dyad combination, biological interaction was only observed between hearing loss and physical inactivity. This figure here shows the three-year change in global score by risk factor status for hearing loss and physical inactivity. So blue is without both hearing loss and physical inactivity. Green is hearing loss only, purple is physical inactivity only, and pink is having both hearing loss and physical inactivity. The white color box on top, which is this here, it indicates the effect of risk factor status compared to none, so to the blue bar. So the joint effect of hearing loss and physical inactivity was larger than the sum of individual effect of hearing loss only and physical inactivity only. And this indicates that the, indicates the synergistic effect of hearing loss and physical inactivity on cognition. The triad combination with the strongest association was hearing loss, hypertension, and physical inactivity. And for the tetrad combination, it was hearing loss, hypertension, physical inactivity, and sleep disturbance. However, none of the triad and tetrad combinations show the synergistic effect. So we have four key takeaways from these two studies we shared today. First key takeaway is that up to 50% of dementia cases in Canada are attributable to 12 modifiable risk factors, highlighting a great potential for dementia prevention in Canada. The second takeaway is that the prevention potential was already large at midlife, and this highlights the importance of implementing public health strategies from midlife, not from the later life. Third takeaway is that strategies to increase physical inactivity and promote effective management of hearing health, obesity, and hypertension will have greatest potential to mitigate large proportion of dementia cases in the population. And finally, the last takeaway is that targeting hearing loss and physical inactivity in multi-domain intervention trial may offer the greatest potential on reducing dementia risk compared to any other combinations. Um, to point out the key limitations, recently Lancet Commission added two new risk factors and they reclassified some of the later life risk factor to mid-life risk factors. And our study had relatively short follow-up data to assess cognitive change and dementia risk. So based on this for future research, which I would like to do during my postdoc study, um, studies can benefit from utilizing longer follow-up data and data linkage, which is now available in CLSA, using relative risk reflecting the Canadian population to estimate the potential population impact and incorporating change in risk factor levels and its impact on cognition. And lastly, I've been very fortunate to create the desk calendar summarizing my findings from the first study. And I'm very grateful to CCNA for their knowledge translation fund. In this dementia calendar, each month represents each risk factor and summary of the key findings and lifestyle tips for that targeted risk factor of the month are also summarized at the bag of calendar as well. So this is what calendar looks like. And if you're interested in, please email me with the number of copies you'd like to receive. And I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Speechley and Montero Dasso, as well as my thesis advisor, Dr. Jill, and co-authors of the first paper and our gate and brain team. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for that uh, excellent presentation and for highlighting some of the work that you've done um, to actually move that into um, practice at the end. Um, I'd like to open it now up to questions. Um, there's already a few, I believe, that are listed. Just a reminder that the muting will remain on, though, um, but you can enter your questions into the Q&A box in the bottom of the uh, Zoom box. Uh, so going back to the first question, which would have been earlier on in the presentation, uh, the question is, why not use the 2024 Lancet infographic on risk management, which included 14 risk factors? Um, thank you. I included the combi plot with the 12 risk factor because that's when I was designing my study. So I thought it aligns well with my findings. But I, as I mentioned in the limitation, the 
there were two new risk factors that's added to the model. So that can be good future research to do. Great. Um, and the next question is, I'm surprised that these risk factors do not include medication use or pill burden among them. Has this factor been discussed at all in either Canadian studies or other studies in the world? Have they asked partly because of some studies showing that greater use of anti-cholinergenic drugs is a predictor of later dementia diagnosis? Um, and Joanna also included a example um, uh, link to a study that addresses this. Um, I haven't, when I was looking at, when I was coming up with the candidates of risk factor, I wanted to compare our population preventable potential in Canada to worldwide and then other countries. So I only focused on the 12 risk factors that was included in the Lancet report. But I am not too familiar with other risk factors and their population impact, but that would be nice addition to look into it later because the, the drug is more on effect modification than its prevention. So it might be worth to looking at how much using of this anticholinergic drug help with like preventing dementia, then looking at it as preventable effects of cholesterol or I'm not sure what is preventing for, but that condition alone. Okay. Um, and I should also add to if uh, Dr. Speech, if you want to jump in at all, just uh, just feel free. And uh, but I'll trust, I'm sure Sarin uh, knows her research well and uh, this area, so. Uh, okay, so moving on, um, is there a reason that air pollution was not included? Air pollution exposure has been linked to the CLSA and has exposure prevalence um, for traffic-related pollution, which is the basis of the Lancet Commission risk es estimate, incidentally from a Canadian study, 30% of the population is exposed. Uh, yeah, that's on that? Mm -hmm. I didn't include air pollution because when I was designing with this study, my interest was how we can implement this in clinical trial level, like multi-domain intervention trial, because there are many intervention trials are going on and it's really hard to target air pollution in clinical trials. So I didn't look at it, but I know a study from McMaster Group, they estimated the potential population impact of air pollution in Canada. So maybe the study will be good resource to look into its impact. And the next question from Monique is, um, would any of the study participants already be living with dementia? Um, for CLSA sampling, the people with severe cognitive impairment or dementia was excluded from the baseline. So none of the participants had dementia or significant cognitive decline. So they were more healthy population. Um, next question is, identifying these risk factors, dyads and triads, is a brilliant and helpful. So, nice comment. I'm wondering, have you had any guesses regarding the interactive effects identifying the mechanism in which these factors impact on cognitive performances? So, I looked up their interaction effect of the combinations on cognition, and instead of looking at effect modification, how having you know, physical inactivity is modifying the effect of hearing loss. I rather looking into biological interaction. So combining this to how the effects are greater than having individual one alone. So hopefully that answers. Um, the next question from Ina Woven, were you able to determine if hearing aids reduce the risk for those with hearing impairment? Um, I didn't look into whether having any treatment are helping with, you know, reducing dementia risk in CLSA data, but I know there are a lot of research groups in Canada. They've demonstrated that using of hearing aids reduce the dementia risk. So, yeah, there is a study out there supporting use of hearing aids to prevent dementia or reduce your dementia risk. Um, I just thought, just a reminder too that, uh, we do have 20 minutes for questions and there's lots of questions, but if if um, if you have questions to put it into the Q&A and not the chat, because um, I know there's a lot of people that may have came a little bit late. 
to get that reminder. Okay, next question though, um, is considering the number of variables in your analyses, do you have concerns about violating the positivity assumption required for your causal in inference? Um, I've looked up multi correlation among all 12 risk factors and maybe due to I dichotomize them into yes or no, having them or not having them. The multicollinearity was fairly low. It was like lowest, less than 30.3. So, but I haven't looked into doing some analysis to look at positivity, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the risk factor I adjusted in the model are also adjusted used to adjust for confounding effects in other risk factors. So when less education is the common covariage, we adjust in looking at risk factor association with dementia, so. Uh, next question, did you look into how race or ethnicity might moderate the relationship between your uh, identified modifiable risk factors and dementia prevalence? Um, I would love to looking at how they differ by ethnicity or immigrant status, but given the data set that 95% of them are white, um, I haven't, I didn't have like enough power or sample size to look at how these associations differ by ethnicity. So lots of questions. You're uh, keeping very busy, Sarin. Uh, uh, there are several formulations for calculating PAF. Why did you choose this specific one? I chose specific one because I wanted to compare with Lancet report and in order to be comparable with the that study and other findings, I wanted to use the same formula. So it's more comparable. Okay, so next question from Lorianne. Uh, the 2020 Lancet report used the term potentially modifiable risk factors. Are you comfortable that we have enough data on these risk factors to drop the word potentially? <laughs> I think it's really, I mean, this population of triple fraction is based on strong assumption that risk factors are eliminated completely from population, which is not possible in real life. So I think it's important to have potential in the, when we call these modifiable risk factor. Um, have any studies shown that by improving a person's hearing loss early, the presentation of dementia is reduced or slowed, or is it just an association? Um, and did you control for genetic presentation of dementia in the patient's family? Um, sorry, I did not just for any genetic risk factor because I was only looking at the modifiable risk factors, but that might be interesting future research to do, how the APOE genotype are impacting the association of hearing aids use or hearing loss on cognition. Okay. Um, next question, does lowering the risk factors result in reduction of present dementia symptoms? And was this studied as part of your research? Um, this wasn't part of my research. My research was to prevent future dementia rather than improving its symptoms. So, or delaying the cognitive decline so we can prevent dementia, like pushing back the occurrence of dementia to further later. Okay. Yeah, if uh, I could just, uh, pardon yeah. me, Jenna, if I could just add a quick uh, uh, comment here. Serum started this work about three or three and a half years ago. And so she set out to basically replicate the Lancet Commission report, which was a big deal at the time. And so that's the, the answer to a lot of these questions is she was following, she was trying to replicate the uh, the original Lancet report. Um, and then I get it to that last question. This is this was not an intervention study that, that Surim did because the CLSA is an observational study, but we're thinking we could use the results to help design the next generation of intervention trials. So I think that's an important distinction to make. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to keep uh, Anthony Levinson's note up there because it's got some useful information uh, so people can read that. Um, I'll go on to the next question. Is it possible to distinguish untreated versus treating treated hearing loss in the CLSA? I ask this because loss of sensory function, such as hearing and smell, might be considered an early indicator of underlying brain changes. Um, distinguishing treated versus untreated hearing loss might be 
better assess whether this is a causal mechanism. I agree. Um, because my research was aiming at estimating the population impact, I wasn't looking into the causal effect of hearing loss on cognition, but the hearing loss I used in my study was untreated one, so hearing tests without the hearing aids, but it will be nice to see how the effects differ by treated hearing loss and untreated hearing loss. Okay. Um, and Next, there's a, a comment that this is an excellent, that uh, that this is all excellent to look at the combinations. Um, uh, I expect that adding vision, which is often combined with hearing loss, will be similar. Functionally, communication that relies on sensory health is necessary for optimal participation in physical activity and physical problems are clearly exacerbated by hearing loss. Functionally, the combinations are very important. So um, I realize there's no question in that. So I'll maybe leave that up for, for people to have a look through that important point as well. Okay, so we will move on to Judith. Do you think the factor uh, hearing loss is more related to the social isolation it creates or more related to the physical or gene causing the hearing loss? Um, I think this is kind of, hard question to answer because we still don't know what's the exact mechanism that hearing loss is causing dementia or cognitive decline because there are two hypotheses that people with hearing loss are more likely to have social isolation so altogether it's leading to cognitive decline or it can be some biological mechanism that's related to sensory and that's leading to cognitive decline. So based on what my finding is, I didn't look up to understand their biological interactions. So I'm not too sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, again, some positive comments. Has the time varying of the risk factor was taking into account, such as, um, for example, onset of diabetes? Um, no, I didn't take into account the time varying risk factor, but I'm really interested in looking at how the effects of time varying risk factors on cognition for my future study. So, yeah. okay. uh, again, very positive comment. Could you please elaborate on how you calculated co communality and the weighting used for principal access factor or PIS? Yeah, so I actually had a slide on it, sorry. So, so in the principal component analysis, after calculating individual population attributable fraction, I use the principal component analysis to calculate the commonality, which is explaining how much variable has in common with other variables. And then I use the, I calculated weight by subtracting one from the commonality. So it's indicating the unique variance that's explained to the variance. And so weighting was done by incorporating the common variance between risk factor vectors. And you can find more details in the Lancet report and other studies as well. Okay. Uh, have you considered, the questions just keep coming, um, have you considered continuous employment after age 65 as something that might modify the risk? I did not look at how effect modification by age, but I didn't present it here, but I also stratified my second study by age group, so people aged before 65 and greater than 65. Um, the risk factor combination that was associated with the strong, that was most strongly associated with cognition was similar in both age groups, but the effect size was much larger in midlife than the later life. Uh, from your research, do you have insights on how health professionals can support individuals to increase physical activity into their daily lives? Mm -hmm. It's very hard thing to do, but I know there's a lot of clinical trials that's been going on to promote physical activity. Um, I always tell my parents to go out and enjoy sunshine and then they can take walks three days a day, sorry, three times a week 
and then they can also go to gym or doing some weightlifting two times a week. But regarding making, pushing them to do is very challenging thing to do. And I think there is a lot of research trying to understand how we can motivate people to, you know, they get more interest in changing their lifestyle and doing more physical activity. Yeah. Um, next question. How do you think about the possibility that observational studies linking risk factors to cognitive outcomes may overestimate the causal effect? In the specific example of physical activity and dementia and cognitive decline, RCTs tend to estimate much smaller effects than observational studies. I do completely agree because, you know, observational study, especially in my study, I dichotomize them as having this risk factor or not. So it's more likely to overestimate the effect. Um, but it's... I'm not sure if Dr. Speechley, you have something to add on. Um, a, a, a great question. And I mean, I think we should emphasize to everybody that any number that you ever see is a max, maximum possible uh, uh, prevention target is 50% or 40%. And that, even that is kind of uh, dreamy or highly idealistic. If you look at a lot of risk factors for a lot of outcomes, clinical trials show smaller effects than the observational study. So this is a major problem across the, the observational experimental divide that we're still working on. Uh, so great question. These are, these are optim, uh, maximum and you know, probably unrealistic in reality. Thank you. Um, next question is that, uh, have there been any studies on how the exposure to blue light from computers and iPads uh, might contribute to dementia? I'm not too familiar with the research looking at vision loss or the effect of blue light, but I know there was a study from US. They looked up the vision. I'm not sure how they defined vision loss, but there is a study they looked at how vision loss is related to dementia and their population impact. And vision loss was included into Lancet report this year. So I think there will be more findings coming up from this year about. I think the link there is probably gonna be through uh, sleep disturbance. We, we There are Canadians working in uh, sleep interventions using blue light or non-blue light before bedtime and turn off the screens and things like that. It's a very active area of research and a great another great question. Okay, uh, next question. Um, I'm very interested in how you quantified cognitive performance in AIM-2. Did your team consider the cognitive impairment indicator protocol available through the CLSA? Um, I didn't use the cognitive measure that was defined by CLSA. I wanted to make sure my outcome measure was aligning with those used in clinical trials. So I calculated the composite death score using just standardizing those score into their baseline. But I know CLSA have multiple cognitive outcome that's been standardized to different effects. So they will be beneficial too. Um, and Kathy Pecora Fuller made a, uh, provided a note on uh, the use of hearing aids and reducing dementia. So I'll leave that up for a minute or two for people to read. Um, and the next question, um, have you considered comorbidities among risk factors? I haven't looked up. So comorbidity of risk factor, com people with having more than two risk factors. Um, I looked up cumulative effect of risk factor combinations on cognition. So having with two risk factors, three risk factors, or four risk factor, and cognitive impairment. The effect of cognition was improving, increasing with the increase in risk factor numbers. I haven't looked up comorbidity of the chronic diseases because I know hypertension and diabetes. Some of the risk factor I included are can indicate the comorbidity as well. So it was too much overlapping with what I had. Um, what confounding variables have been considered? For example, family history, diet, lipid profile. I looked up diabetes and all 12 risk factors, but I wasn't look, considering family history or lipoprotein or any blood measures. Um, 
And what are the main limits or obstacles that can be encountered when measuring the prevalence of dementia in a population? That's a very good question. I didn't estimate prevalence of dementia, but what I've been seeing from the literature is the current prevalence we estimate is likely to be underestimated, underestimate of what the actual prevalence is in the population. Um, yeah, the next... Ed, pardon me, as an epidemiological problem, there are at least four major forms of dementia and they are measured differently at the population level. And it's so it's it's a huge challenge, more so than for something like heart disease. I mean, there are several forms of heart disease as well, but dementia is a is an, a level of complication above that. So that's another really good question. Um, and we have a couple more minutes, so hopefully we'll be able to get through the last couple, uh, last few in the lightning rod, last lightning rod round here. Um, I'm not sure what the next one is, but it's uh, I think. Um, in reference to what um, the greater than 21 units of alcohol per week translates into in millimeters as a modifiable risk factor. I don't know, Serene, if you know. Would you repeat the question again? Sorry. Um, it's how it says greater than 21 U of alcohol per week translates to how much of it in milliliters, which is a modifiable risk factor. I see. Um, I didn't convert back to a millimeter of the alcohol, but I can get back to you after doing calculation. But I know 21 unit is UK guideline, and this is more, their guideline was more lenient with heavy alcohol than Canadian definition. So I believe it's going to be larger number of standard units of drink if we convert back to Canadian. Um, and have you used CLSA sampling weights in your analysis? I waited for both sampling weights in calculating prevalence in first study and then using analytic weights for regression in second study. And again, thank you, Kathy, for your uh, um, references and, and input into the Q&A. Um, Next question uh, by Tina, what is the link to your publication? Um, I think that's all, you can find that in the um, webinar chat. Um, and Ina Woven has a comment too. I'm just trying to make sure we get to the questions. I think uh, we'll move to Ivan's question, sight and sound. If sight signals to brain are delayed, the millisec, uh, sorry, I'm trying to rush through here. Um, I think I think that's it for the questions that we have. Just I'm gonna leave the last few comments up because they're um oh actually Ivan is anything being studied on this aspect of hearing. So it I'll read the whole question. Sight and sound, if sight signals to brain are delayed, the millisecond difference is not noticeable except in some physical reaction except if some physical reaction is needed. If hearing nerve transmission is delayed, the sound is altered and the words are not recognizable and confusion results. The confusion may be interpreted as dementia or loss of cognition. Anything being studied in this area? And maybe we'll make this the last question. Um, as I'm not an audiologist or specialist in hearing loss, I'm not too familiar with these type of research, but yeah, it might be good to look into it. These these questions, a lot of them are perfect examples of why epidemiologists and clinicians have to work together because there's a lot of knowledge, detailed knowledge about clinical interventions and, and uh, clinical knowledge about health conditions themselves that we don't have as epidemiologists. So that's why collaboration, it's a, definitely a team sport. So thank you for all these questions. And I think on that note, we'll uh, bring the webinar to an end. Um, if anyone does have any questions, I invite you to um, get in contact with, with the CLSA or you could, uh, I think Sarim's email is on was on one of the slides. Um, and I would like to say, again, I think I congratulate you and I will, this is the most questions we've ever had and you are well positioned for your thesis defense um, if you haven't uh, done it already. So congrats on congrats on that. Um, so we'll move on to uh, just closing today's webinar. Um, 
I'd like to remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications is January 15th of 2025, and you can visit the data access section of our new website uh, to review available data as well as additional details about that application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey when you exit today. Um, and our next webinar is entitled Examining the Social Environment and its Relevance to Healthy Aging in the CLSA. Um, it'll be on November 26th at noon by Dr. Diva Nielsen, who's uh, an associate professor in the School of Nutrition at McGill. Um, and she will co-present co with Dr. Catherine Labonte, who is in the School of Psychology at Laval. Um, registration details are available on our website for the next webinar. Um, and finally, uh, CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, um, and we invite you to follow us um, using the hashtag at CLSA underscore ELCB. Thank you again to both of you for coming today, and uh, best of luck with the rest of your research and enjoy the rest of the day.